Welcome to our TPA Global Webinar. Today we are going to discuss the increased controversy expected after BEPS and MLI in Africa. The presenter for today is going to be Professor Daniel Erasmus, Independent Tax Advisor for TRM Daniel Erasmus Tax Court Practitioners, and Ajahn Professor of International Tax and Transfer Pricing at Thomas Jefferson School of Law in the United States of America. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone to this, this seminar. So as the um, aim of the seminar is to give my personal views on some of the emerging and developing international tax issues uh, in Africa post BEPS and the um, multilateral instrument, the MLI. There have been numerous developments uh, more or less taking place over the same period of time. For instance, the MLI publication, uh, the instrument itself, the explanatory memorandum, the signing of the MLI, and then of course the recent release of the 2017 draft commentaries which became or were accepted last week on the 23rd of November by the OECD. So the uh, OECD model convention commentaries have now been updated. Now as a starting point I will focus on one of the aspects of the MLI and the 2017 OECD commentaries. We don't have enough time in this, in this talk to, to cover much else, and, and even that's going to be a, a fairly cursory sort of uh, overview, but to point out some of the concerns and risks that I see emerging, certainly from a, an Africa perspective. Doesn't mean to say it won't apply elsewhere, but my focus point and my, my practice is, is in Africa as a, as a tax planner and as a, a tax litigation counsel. So my views emanate from close on 30 years experience that I've had working with uh, revenue authorities uh, in, in Africa. Now, um, having appeared um, as, as tax counsel in a number of different African tax jurisdictions, uh, I have chosen three cases that I'm currently involved in uh, for multinational enterprises um, in a number of different African countries, and um, and I'm going to then focus on uh, three three areas that that have come up in those disputes. Uh, one is the application of Article Nine of the OECD Model Convention uh, on Associated Enterprises. Um, as being a charging section used by one of the revenue authorities in, a, in an attempt to apply a transfer pricing adjustment under circumstances where they did not have uh, underlying uh, transfer pricing legislation. And that seems to be a theme that may recur throughout Africa because many of the jurisdictions uh, excluding South Africa, which has had its uh, uh, transfer pricing legislation since 1999, um, in fact, I think before that, but um, uh, many of the other jurisdictions have only introduced transfer pricing legislation recently, and so nevertheless are going back in time prior to that transfer pricing legislation in order to attempt to make transfer pricing adjustments. So here's an example of what's being done by one of the revenue authorities by an attempt to rely on Article 9 of a double tax treaty provision between that country and, in this particular example, Switzerland. Um, in another jurisdiction, uh, along similar lines, the revenue authority has attempted to rely on the general anti-avoidance provision, uh, which in, in its wording is quite similar uh, amongst the Certainly, the uh, former, um, those particular African jurisdictions that base their legal systems on the, on the English system and the old English Income Tax Act, you'll find that the wording of the general anti avoidance provisions are fairly similar, and that the general anti avoidance provision is being used in instances to make the necessary transfer pricing adjustments. And then lastly, um, in, in another jurisdiction, uh, we've seen uh, an attempt by the revenue authorities uh, through the application of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. Uh, what they've done is 
is really to conflate the application of those guidelines in order to justify the um, transfer pricing adjustment done in respect of intellectual or um, intellectual property. And so I'll, I'll delve a little bit into that and, and share with you some of the interesting uh, arguments that emerge from that particular revenue authority. So that sort of gives you a, a brief overview of what I'd like to cover. If we turn now to the MLI, um, by now I think all of you will know that um, nine countries in Africa have signed. Uh, more countries uh, participated in the various working group discussions um, at the OECD um, with, from a, re a reliable source, South Africa and Mauritius, I understand, making um, most of the contributions as far as discussions went, and again, I'm relying on, on information that was provided to me from a, a fairly reliable source. And I, I make this point because um, I'm told that you know the other African countries that participated um, made relatively minor contributions, and why would this be significant to me? Um, you know, in my, my experience, some of the revenue authorities in Africa are, are still in the process of filling themselves up through the African Tax um, Administration Forum and other forums that emanate from uh, the OECD uh, to educate themselves on many of these complexities that we're all grappling with in a, a rapidly changing environment with you know, developing OECD transfer pricing guidelines, the new OECD commentaries, the BEPS initiatives, um, and the effect of the multilateral instrument. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's not unique to any one, one particular person in, from a point of view that these are very complex provisions. Now, um, at the same time, the, these revenue authorities, whilst needing to catch up like the rest of us, are also placed under extreme pressure to uh, collect more tax. And, you know, many of the um, uh, non-profit organizations, or some of the non-profit organizations overseas have highlighted the discrepancies that, you know, take place between what is being exported from Africa to the rest of the world and the fact that uh, the transfer pricing um, of that is is really uh, not not in line with what would be what would be arm's length. So, you know, with that, uh, together with the extreme pressure placed on these revenue authorities, um, I certainly, in, in my experience, have found skewed audit findings at the conclusion of audits, and and uh, particularly skewed revised assessments uh, uh, when it comes to these transfer pricing adjustments, as some of my examples uh, will demonstrate a, a little later. Now, we, we run a, an advanced diploma in transfer pricing course worldwide uh, online, and um, numerous revenue officials uh, from, from Africa have, have attended that, and, and, and I, I believe that this is an initiative that uh, all of us, as, certainly as professionals in, on, on this call, uh, should encourage uh, you know, more and more revenue authorities um, to, to attend you know, this type of training and to help skill them up so that they uh, don't come up with these skewed results at the conclusion of, of, of audits. And, and again, it's a generalization. I'm, I'm not pointing a finger in one particular revenue authority, but um, in, this does unfortunately happen as a result of these complexities. So it, it brings me to, to one of the emerging problems I see with regard to the multilateral instrument um, when you read it with, for instance, the new 2017 OECD model convention commentaries. Uh, most of you would have seen it in draft form, and then, of course, it was now accepted by the OECD last on the 23rd of November. So in, in my slides that I'll come up to, I've referred to the page numbers as they existed in the draft commentaries, and then I've updated the page number to what it is now in the actual version accepted by the OECD. And I want to look particularly at articles 12 to 15 of the multilateral instrument, which deals with the permanent establishment. And um, in order for me to illustrate that properly, it, it requires me to sort of give you um, a set of facts. Now, uh, let's, let's say that we have an enterprise in Mauritius, and that particular enterprise in Mauritius um, 
sells commodities worldwide. Now, um, it will have, in this particular case, a South African subsidiary that um, assists in obtaining uh, and approaching clients when these commodities are available and will in some cases assist the enterprise in Mauritius, Mauritius to compete the necessary contracts that, um, that need to be concluded in order to sell the commodities worldwide. Now, um, what is important here, uh, from, you know, this from my reading, is, is one needs to be quite sensitive to what are the activities that would be considered preparatory or auxiliary in, in nature. And, um, and so if we, if we look at the uh, MLI as a starting point to see to what extent the MLI is going to create amendments to the uh, relevant clauses under Article 5 of the OECD Model Convention, let's just take a look at the situation between my example, Mauritius and South Africa. So there's a table in front of you, and uh, this table comes from uh, IBSD, which has created a useful MLI monitor process, and you put in the articles that you want to compare to various jurisdictions, and you'll see that um, in the MLI, Mauritius, for instance, has opted out in respect of all of those articles pertaining to permanent um, establishments. South Africa, on the other hand, has um, South Africa, on the other hand, has um, opted in on some of those provisions. Obviously, uh, although both of those um, double tax double tax treaties between the, the two countries would be one of the uh, double tax treaties that the MLI would apply to, it's going to have no effect when it comes to the permanent establishment clauses in the DTA between South Africa and Mauritius because Mauritius has opted out. So you're not going to see those amendments flow through and unless Mauritius and South Africa outside of the MLI negotiate a further protocol to that particular double tax agreement, you're not going to you're not going to see these particular amendments flow through. But now what happens is um, if, if you now look at the commentaries, so uh, what I'm going to do is um, take you down to uh, what um, I'm going to take you down to the, the commentaries themselves, and um, you'll see that. Um, let me just open the commentaries, and I, I just want to show you what the wording says. So, if you bear with me for a minute, we have. Um, so, I'm going to just switch my computer off for a second because I want to scroll up to what the commentaries now say, and here's my concern, is that the, the commentaries are going to be read by individuals, and, and I'm now really uh, looking specifically at the revenue authorities, and although the MLI does not apply under this particular situation, um, these commentaries have now been amended and the, the amendments to Articles 12 through to 15 are reflected in the amendments to the actual OECD model convention as well. And so typically people will tend to pick up these commentaries and start reading them, and the wording that's been inserted into the amended OECD uh, model convention, which reflects what Article 15 states in the MLI, those commentaries are now in the general commentaries and maybe may be interpreted to apply across the board regardless of whether or not the MLI has amended the underlying double tax treaty or regardless of the fact whether or not the countries in question have negotiated a further protocol to amend their permanent establishment provisions. So if we, I go back to where I started with this increasing pressure to collect more revenue and with a lack of of significant education, um, the, typically these particular revised commentaries may in instances be misinterpreted and ap applied in circumstances that are, are much t intended to be much wider when in fact the actual original double tax treaty isn't as wide as what the commentaries make it out to be. So let's just take a look at, at paragraph 60, and I don't want to go through all these paragraphs, I just want to highlight a couple of paragraphs to you, and, and that would include two examples. So as a general rule, an activity that has a preparatory character is one that is carried on 
in contemplation of the carrying of, on of what constitutes the essential and significant part of the activity of the enterprise as a whole. Now, I don't think any particular amendment to the MLI, in the MLI or in the OECD con convention um, speaks to this. I think this is just a, a clarification of what already is a general principle. So since a preparatory activity precedes another activity, it will often be carried out, uh, carried on during a relatively short period, the duration of that period uh, being determined by the nature of the core activities of the enterprise. But if we now skip to, to some of the emerging examples, this is where it starts becoming sort of more, more risky and dangerous, I think. Um, so look at paragraph 72, also where an enterprise that sells goods worldwide. Now bear in mind the example I gave you of the Mauritian enterprise with a South African subsidiary that's assisting, establishes an office in a state and the employee, so in my example in South Africa, and the employees working at that office take an active part in the negotiation of important parts of contracts for the sale of goods to buyers in South Africa, in this, this case, without habitually concluding contracts or playing the principal role leading to the conclusion of contracts, for example, by participating in decisions related to the type, quality, or quantity of products covered by these contracts, such activities will usually constitute an essential part of the business operations of the enterprise being the one in Mauritius and should not be regarded as having a preparatory or auxiliary character within the meaning of subparagraph C of paragraph subparagraph four of Article five. Um, I'm just reading into that. If the conditions of paragraph one are met, such an office will therefore constitute a permanent establishment. So here's the question mark. Um, if you look at the amendments to the OECD model convention that have now been introduced and they're in line with what the amending provisions in the MLI state, this interpretation or, or explanatory memorandum example speaks to those amendments. But I certainly see this particular explanatory uh, memorandum example being applied to existing double tax treaties where one may argue that the wording doesn't go quite as far as incorporating what is being explained here and that's where I see a, a potential risk emerging uh, where you, you have multinationals um, as I've given in my example with different offices around the world assisting the enterprise situated in Mauritius or where, wherever that might be in, in concluding uh, particular agreements for the purposes of the sale of, of their goods or services, as the case may be. So I'm going to I'm going to um, close off my um, computer again and go down to the next example, um, which really emphasises the point. So the the following is another example that illustrates the application of paragraph five. So R R C O, a company resident of state R. Uh, distributes various products and services worldwide through its website. So let's say that's the Mauritian Enterprise. SEO, a, a company resident of South Africa, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Mauritius. South Africa's employees send, uh, send emails, make telephone calls, or visit large organizations in order to convince them to buy the Mauritius products and services and therefore responsible for large accounts in um, South Africa. South Africa's employees whose remuneration is partially based on the revenues derived by Mauritius from the holders of these accounts, use their relationship building skills to try to anticipate the needs of these account holders and to convince them to acquire the products and service offered by the uh, Mauritian company or enterprise. When one of these account holders is persuaded by an employee of South Africa to purchase a given quantity of goods or services, the employee indicates the price that will be payable for the quantity uh, indicates that a contract must be concluded online with the Mauritian company before the goods or services can be provided and explains the standard terms of M the Mauritian contracts, uh, including the fixed price structure used by Mauritius, which the employee is not, not authorized to modify. The account holder subsequently concludes that contract online for the uh, quantity discussed with the South African employee and in accordance with the price structure presented by that employee. In this example, South Africa's employees play the principal role leading to the conclusion of the contract between the account holder and Mauritius, and such contracts are routinely concluded without material modification by the Mauritian enterprise. 
the fact that the South African employees cannot vary the terms of the contract does not mean that the conclusion of the contract is not the direct result of the activities that they perform on behalf of the enterprise, convincing the account holder to accept these standard terms being the crucial element leading to the conclusion of the contracts between the account holder and the merchant enterprise. So hopefully you'll, you'll see uh, what I'm trying to, to say here is that this is definitely creating a much broader web when it comes to the application of permanent establishment principles and the interpretation thereof, notwithstanding the fact that these examples speak specifically to the amending provisions as contained in the MLI and as contained in the revised OECD model convention. And I, I certainly do see uh, potential difficulties emerging from that. Before I move on to my next slide, um, maybe some of you have got some questions or comments that you would like to make around this particular point. This is just my personal view. It's not the subject matter of any particular um, dispute that we have at the moment. It's just a, a, a difficulty I see emerging. So let me pause for a moment and, and um, uh, Gaia, if you can just assist me in, in uh, fielding any questions or comments that anyone may have on this particular point. Daniel, for now we have no question, but I would like to inform all attendees that if they have any question, they can type into the question chat box and we will uh, reply to them. Thank you very much. You're Let welcome. me proceed. Right, so moving on to my first um, sort of case that I wanted to discuss, which um, is based out of, uh, out of, out of Malawi. Um, so Malawi, interestingly enough, has a very old uh, double tax treaty. Um, in fact, what they did back in the day when they, when they were part of um, uh, the, um, uh, they were a British colony, they actually adopted the UK double tax treaty back, I think, in 1956. And if we, we take a look at that particular double tax treaty, um, you'll see that the wording is very similar to what we would see in any Article 9 associated enterprise clause. Uh, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm showing it to you on the screen, and most of you are, are aware of this particular type of wording that exists in, in many of the double tax treaties that we have. Now, um, what the uh, Mauritian uh, authorities uh, did here, and, and what I'm going to do is take you to the uh, provisions that exist currently, and these provisions in the Malawi uh, Taxation Act have subsequently been added to by the addition of a section 127 capital A dealing specifically with transfer pricing, but the years under audit and to which the revised assessment relates was in respect of years prior to the 127 capital A transfer pricing legislation taking effect. So their, their general avoidance provision is the one that would apply here. And if you look at 127 subsection two, where the commission is of the opinion that the main purpose or one of the main purpose for which any transaction or transactions was or were affected, whether before or after the passing of the Act, was the avoidance or reduction of liability to tax for any year, or that the main benefit which might have been expected to accrue from the transaction or transactions was the avoidance or reduction of liability to tax, he may, if he determines it to be just and reasonable, direct that such adjustments shall be made as respects liability to tax as he considers appropriate to counteract the avoidance or reduction of liability to tax, which would normally be affected by the transaction or transactions. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there. So that's what the general pr provision read. So what they did is they um, simply went and uh, applied said, well, if we look at Article 9 or Article 4 of the, the Associated Inter Enterprise Clause in the Malawi-Swiss Double Tax Treaty, because the adjustment was between Malawi and a Swiss organization, then um, that's what they're relying upon. So the question is, you know, can you rely on an article in a double tax treaty, so the state relies on the article in the double tax treaty effectively as a charging provision. And 
here, um, if I uh, refer to um, a well-known international writer, um, Brian Arnold out of Canada, um, in one of his introductions on tax treaties, and I think this is uh, very much a widespread um, uh, supported uh, very widely by other commentators, in general tax treaties do not impose tax. Tax is imposed by domestic law. Therefore, tax treaties limit the taxes otherwise imposed by a state. In effect, tax treaties are primarily relieving in nature. Similarly, tax treaties do not allocate taxing rights, although it is often claimed that they do. In light of this fundamental principle, it is usually appropriate before applying the provisions of a tax treaty to determine whether the amount in question is subject to domestic tax. If the amount is not subject to tax under domestic law, it is unnecessary to consider the treaty. So if, if one were to take you know, this stance, um, it's, clear, it's clear that the um, authorities in, in Malawi were or are incorrect in relying upon Article 4 as a type of charging section in order to be able to make a transfer pricing adjustment, which in this particular case related to what they considered to be um, the application of a thin capitalization rule. So what happened was the Malawi entity would pay and dividend out all of its profits um, to its parent company, uh, primarily because it, it was exposed to significant um, currency fluctuations and the parent company would then in turn make available any funding that was required uh, for the working capital of the Malawi enterprise but at a zero interest charge. So Malawi attempted to or made an adjustment for what what they imputed as being um, you, you know thin capitalization and an interest charge that, that that should should be made in respect of of what was not charged in the first place. So um, in addition to that, they also undercharged. They also claimed that the Malawian company had undercharged for the products that it was selling to its uh, its Swiss enterprise. And that's, that's where the adjustments came in from a transfer pricing point of view. Now, um, in, in my view, that's incorrect. Um, you, cannot, you cannot apply the provisions of Article 4 on associated enterprises uh, in, in, in an attempt to make the appropriate adjustments in the absence of a specific transfer pricing uh, provision that exists in the income tax legislation, which, as I when I started off, um, I explained, uh, explained to you that Section 127 Capital A now provides for that and pro provides for a profit adjustment within the Malawi um, entity um, as we would have in this particular case. Uh, but that was not the case in the years in question. It, it also raises another very interesting discussion point, sort of off on a tangent, and that is, and, and again, it, it it has application to the multilateral instrument as well. You know, what, what is the effect of ratification of a double tax agreement, or in this particular case, the multilateral instrument? Um, you know, does, does that mean that the uh, bilateral treaty automatically becomes domestic law, or is there some other step that is required? And, and I think those of us who have looked carefully into various laws that apply in this particular instance, it, it depends very much upon the domestic laws of the state in question. And I can certainly speak um, from a South African perspective where the uh, constitution directs what will happen in the event that an international treaty is entered into. And um, it requires the... Uh, the House of Parliament, the House of Parliament, to to actually um, ratify that particular international treaty. But in addition to that, for it to become part of South Africa's domestic law, it requires specific legislation to do so. And in South Africa, there is a particular provision in the Income Tax Act um, under Section 108, which states that uh, once ratification has taken place, the uh, double tax treaty or the international treaty, in this case the MLI, 
um, once it is published in a government gazette, then effect is, is given to the requirement that enabling legislation must be promulgated. And then it does become part of South Africa's domestic law. Prior to the publication in the government gazette, the, the obligation is on the state to, to um, actually abide by what those provisions are. Um, but there are no underlying rights which then, or obligations which are then transferred to the uh, taxpayers in South Africa before such promulgation takes place. Now that does differ from country to country and uh, introduces an interesting angle as to how this is going to work in the other countries in Africa um, and at, at what point does, does that MLI become uh, operative and um, again, it's, it's a different point to what I was making on the, the approach by the Malawian authorities on this particular matter. Um, but uh, interesting questions arise. I have uh, included with the documentation submitted for this particular conference uh, a, a very good article uh, dealing with the South African aspect and whether or not it's being a um, self-executing uh, treaty, which in practice it's not. Um, but those of you who have an interest in this, by all means, please take a look at the materials that I have distributed. Okay, so moving on, um, I now want to deal with uh, a problem that we faced in Zimbabwe. And again, very interesting uh, situation where we are back to the question of the application of a general anti-avoidance provision. And um, uh, without boring you now with specific provisions out of the judgments, um, and I have made the judgments available and they've be, the relevant extracts have been highlighted for you to take a look at. Um, in, in those judgments uh, uh, and the arguments we put, uh, we put to court, which, um, which is based on, on, on two key judgments. One is uh, G Bank Zimbabwe Limited versus Zimra, the uh, Zimbabwe Revenue Authority. And that judgment is based on the Commission of Inland Revenue versus King, which is a South African a Supreme Court um, or Appellate Division judgment. Um, and at the end of the day, the question is, in applying a general anti-avoidance provision, is the commissioner given, or the tax authority, given sufficient powers to actually create a transaction that was not entered into between the parties or other parties that may be related to each other in that transaction? In other words, take a, let's say for instance, in, in my particular uh, case, we had a whole company in Zimbabwe the holding company in Zimbabwe had a subsidiary in Zimbabwe. The subsidiary was the entity that was staffed with the personnel that had the necessary knowledge, and they in turn uh, made available their expertise to subsidiaries around Africa and charged a management fee. So what Zimra did is they said, well, firstly, that management fee is not sufficient. So they imputed an additional charge over and above what had been charged. So the first question is, does the general anti-avoidance provision go that far to allow them to actually um, increase the amount of the management fee under the circumstances that I've just explained? Secondly, they um, went and uh, redirected the entire management fee to the holding company. So they said the management fee shouldn't have been earned by the um, subsidiary, it should have been earned by the holding company, and of course um, adjusted it upwards, as I've just explained. Now if you, <clears throat> if you go and look at uh, the G-Bank case, and you look at the case of, of King, and in fact I think it's probably useful if I take you, if I take you into, into those cases to the relevant sections that I, I wanted to illustrate, um, and I'm going to just blank out my, my screen for a minute and reduce the size of this particular, of this particular matter. Um, so just bear with me for a second. Right. So what had happened in the Zimbabwe case is the um, funds 
were being deposited into what's known as Nostra accounts, which were not paying out any interest. So what the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority did was to impute an interest charge, was to impute an interest charge um, uh, to the Zimbabwe uh, company. Um, and what the, the judge held, um, and again, let me just blank out my screen while, while I scroll down. Um, Sorry, I'm going to get there in a minute. Okay, so if you look at um, out of the head note of the case, which should be in front of you now, um, I'm reading from uh, paragraph 7, that the respondent had lost sight of the fundamental principle behind our income tax legislation, that it was designed to tax income that had been created. Income must have accrued to or been received by the taxpayer. It is not designed to tax income which is not in and has not come into existence in either way. Income had to exist before it became liable to taxation. The income must either have accrued to or been received or deemed to have accrued or been received by the taxpayer in order to trigger tax liability. That, in any event, stripped of all the technical points, um, CIR versus King, amongst other things, had established that there was no obligation on a taxpayer to earn income, and it was clear that where the activities of a taxpayer do not fall or fail to create income, it is beyond the remit of the commissioner to wear the mantle of an investment advisor to the taxpayer and suggest to the taxpayer avenues for more income creation. So based on, on those principles, we argued that the uh, general anti-avoidance provision does not go that far, and which is why it is necessary for specific legislation to be introduced to allow the taxpayer to make the appropriate adjustment either to the profits of the organization or, um, as is oftentimes the case, such as in the South African legislation, the commissioner then has the power to adjust the taxable income or determine the taxable income to reflect what would be an arm's length charge. So there's a specific provision that gives specific powers to make that adjustment, and that does not appear in the wording of the, anti, the general anti-avoidance provisions. So again, I, I bring your attention to this because you are going to find that in Africa, notwithstanding transfer pricing legislation, specific transfer pricing legislation being introduced, they are still going to go back to those years of assessment where the transfer pricing legislation did not exist and will attempt to apply these provisions as I have illustrated. And those would be the sort of arguments that you may that you may that you may build um, uh, in in defending those those situation if if you are in, in agreement with uh, our interpretation. Right. So let's move sorry, on Daniel, to, to a. Hi Daniel, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you, but I received the, an answer for the second question, and I would like to share it with you. Um, the answer to that second yes. question is that. To the extent these anti-avoidance rules are part of the basic domestic rules set by domestic tax laws for determining which facts give rise to a tax liability. They are not addressed in the tax treaties and are therefore not affected by them. Thus, as paragraph 9.2 of the 2014 OECD commentary on Article 1st, a general rule, there will be no conflict between such rules and the provision of tax convention. Yes, that deals with the that deals with a, a conflict, um, a potential conflict scenario between the domestic legislation and what would appear in the um, double tax double tax uh, convention. Um, I'm, I'm aware of of that particular commentary, and but I'm not sure to what extent that takes one in either direction in, in, in respect of the specific problems we've encountered in my example in, in Malawi or in my example in Zimbabwe. In, in the uh, South African example, uh, interesting set of facts, the, um, the holding company uh, made available a trademark to its operating subsidiaries uh, uh, around Africa and 
had made a determination in its uh, transfer pricing documentation that um, first and foremost made a determination as to what the intangible earnings of each of the operating subsidiaries were. So intangible earnings would not just take into account the trademark or the brand earnings. So let's say the trademark itself was a brand. It would take into account the brand earnings as, as well as the earnings generated by any other intangible property uh, within that operating subsidiary and, and within the greater group. And um, they determined that, um, for argument's sake, I'll just throw a percentage out, they determined that the, the brand earnings percentage was, for argument's sake, 20% of the total intangible earnings of, of the group and of the operating subsidiaries. And uh, what the company did is it said, right, we are making available a brand to these operating subsidiaries and the operating subsidiaries are taking that brand into a jurisdiction which is completely new to the brand. People in that jurisdiction know nothing about the brand and um, in addition the entity, the subsidiary in the, op the operating subsidiary in the other country um, uh, had obtained certain operating licenses and would have to put in all the effort and take all the risk and expend all the expenditure in promoting that new brand in that particular territory. And as a result, a determination was made by the company that, um, again, for argument's sake, if we took the 20% the 20, the 20 that was allocated to brand earnings, um, they made a determination that uh, uh, a third of that would third of the 20% would be, so that's roughly just under 7% um, would be, uh, of that 20% would be uh, paid back to the South African holding company for making available that intellectual property, the trademark, the brand, and the other two thirds w wouldn't be paid because that would be the, the effort that had been put in by that local subsidiary in building that particular brand. So the, the revenue authority um, said no, having now looked at you know, how valuable this brand is and having determined uh, the policy manuals were all emanated from South Africa and management in South Africa um, played a, a fairly important role in overseeing the way in which the, the, the brand was, was being developed and um, made available and, and marketed in those foreign jurisdictions that the entire brand earnings should come back to South Africa. So if, if I can give you an example, uh, a basic example. So let's say um, you are an entity that makes um, tracksuit hoodies. So the hoodies that, the tracksuit hoodies that we would, we would wear in, in cold weather. And it's a no-name brand. And let's say you, you sold um, 100 of those at ten dollars a piece, so your your total your total um, revenue would be a thousand would be a thousand dollars. Let's say um, Nike in South Africa comes to you, so you're an entity situated for all argument's sake in Nigeria. Uh, Nike uh, South Africa comes to you and says, "Look, we'll we'll place our branding on your hoodie, and now you'll be able to sell." Uh, 300 of those hoodies at $40 a piece. So your turnover or your revenue is going to jump to $12,000. But the Revenue Authority demands that all the brand earnings that are generated by the rebranded hoodies in Nigeria should come back to South Africa. So now your turnover or your revenue jumps to 12000 and based on the principle that I've just shared with you, the demand made by the Revenue Authority that all brand earnings should come back to South Africa, the entire profit, the entire additional revenue that is generated, which is that additional $11,000, would have to come back to South Africa. So that, that equates to the logic that, that was being applied by, by the Revenue Authority. And, and in order to justify that, what they did, interestingly enough, is... Um, uh, so, in, in, let me first take you 
through a little journey and, and, and take you first and foremost to the practice note that deals specifically with um, the practice note that deals specifically with transfer pricing in, in South Africa, and that is uh, transfer pricing practice note seven of uh, 1999. Um, first and foremost, it says at 3.2.3, the OECD guidelines should be followed in the absence of specific guidance in terms of this practice note, the provisions of Section 31 or the tax treaties entered into by South Africa. So when it comes to, when it comes to intellectual property, and again, I'm going to switch my screen off for a second so that I can take you to the, to the relevant portion that I wanted to share with you. What we have is, I just want to get to that particular, that particular page. In the practice note, it says at 17, Chapter 6 of the OECD guidelines deals specifically with intangible property. The Commissioner considers the guidance provided in that chapter relevant and recommends that taxpayers follow the guidance in establishing arm's length conditions in international agreements with connected persons involving intangible property. So they, they deflect to Chapter 6. And, um, but what they did in this particular case is they, they went to the OECD transfer pricing guidelines and again, let me just open at those pages. And if you look at the section that deals with the profit split method, which they agreed was the appropriate method to apply, um, the transactional profit split method seeks to eliminate the effect on profits of special conditions made or imposed in a controlled transaction by determining the division of profits that independent enterprises would have expected to realize from engaging in the transaction or transactions. The transactional profit split method first identifies the profits to be split. In my example, that would be the brand earnings. So that's exactly what the taxpayer did for the associated enterprises from the controlled uh, transactions in which the associated enterprises are engaged. Um, references to profit should be taken as applying equally to losses. Interestingly enough, in, in their calculations, they actually uh, removed any losses uh, in, in making that determination, contrary to what this particular guidance says. It then splits those combined profits between the associated enterprises on an economically valid basis that approximates the division of profits that would be, have been anticipated and reflected in an agreement made at arm's length. So they then, they then um, would split, and that's exactly what the taxpayer did. It said of the 20%, one third of that goes to the holding company, two thirds remains with the subsidiary because of the efforts that they, they put in, in developing that particular brand in the country in question. The Revenue Authority then jumps to 6.78, which deals specifically with distributor examples and says, no, well, the, the entity in the foreign country is equivalent to a distributor. And a distributor, if you read uh, paragraph 6.78, a distributor must make extraordinary, have, uh, incur extraordinary expenditure in order to um, derive any benefit from the marketing activities. And they focus specifically on the marketing. So they conflate paragraph 6.78 with paragraph 2.114 in order to justify that entire throwback of the bank earnings into South Africa, which again is, is clearly not in accordance with what the OECD guidelines provides. And so um, the type of distortion one typically sees in, in some of these um, in some of these disputes that, that, that emanate uh, from, from Africa. So let me, let me pause there. I think I've probably said enough, and I think we've got a few minutes left to um, answer any questions. Uh, thank you for, for listening to me. Um, I hope that was clear. So I'm going to open, the, open up for questions, and, and let's see if we can answer those. Okay, I received a question. Yes. Uh, do you see a room for the concept of local marketing intangibles to develop in Africa? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, uh, I'm not sure if the person asking the questions wants to put it into a particular context. I mean, similarly to what has been done in India. W with the party, I'd like to just explain what, what what has been done in India, so that I can I can address specifically what they what they are 
are asking me. So I mean, just um, I mean, typically the marketing. I mean, I think the reference is to you know marketing intangibles having become a um, a fairly sort of hot topic in in transfer pricing, particularly in India. And the um, question is to what extent um, there would be remuneration for the local development of the intangibles. I mean, so that's exactly what this case that I shared with you is really about. And that is that there's recognition for the development of the, the brand that was developed um, in this particular case in South Africa and has now been further developed in the uh, operating subsidiary in Africa. So if you you know, if you were to, for instance, take a valuation of the public company in South Africa, its its value, by virtue of the the increase in brand value, has has increased substantially. So the share market value would have increased substantially in South Africa as a direct result of the uh, local input by subsidiaries around Africa, and so that is why. Um, uh, why it, it would be important to to remunerate them indirectly uh, by ensuring that some of those brand earnings uh, remain with the subsidiary as opposed to all of it being paid back to the holding company. I'm, I'm not sure if that if that answers the, the, the question that that has been put to me. Thanks to you, Daniel. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with us. And thanks again to all attendees.